Si vis pacem parabellum. That's what the Roman used to say. Si vis pacem parabellum. If you want peace, prepare for war. Ah, I have to be honest. I was really conflicted about doing this video. Why? Well, because it's about war. And because I don't want to trivialize war or to make it funny just for the sake of telling a story. But this is a story that is a personal story that goes back to World War II. And so here is the story. But before the story begins, they say that the first casualty of war is the truth. And there is no doubt that war is based on the biggest lie of all. That war can be won. And if war can be won, victory can be denied to your enemy. And if victory cannot be denied to your enemy, you have to make sure that victory for your enemy comes at an extraordinary price so that he does not wage war. But the reality is that in order to take advantage of a peace that is always a compromise, you want to go for war where your enemy is not prepared. And so generals for thousands of years had promised their commanders, I promised the president, I promised the leader, that a, one, a war can be won swiftly if there is a surprise attack. Hey, it never worked out, never, never, never worked out. And in fact, even when it succeeded, it creates a wound that will remain open for hundreds of years. So there is no such a thing as a just war, a war that you have a right to wage against your enemy. Your enemy has crossed too many red lines and you warn him, and now is the time for him to pay the price. It's all a massive pack of lies that has been disproved through centuries. And yet you have the politicians that ask for options and the generals that work with the best strategists in order to come out with the winning formula for a quick war and absolute victory. He never worked. And so, yes, it's true we talk about the fog of war, uh, nobody knows exactly what happened, why it happened, what is happening, when will it end, when did it start, who really triggered it. Yes, 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 you have all of that. But to me, I'm not really concerned with the truth. The truth to me is not universal. The truth is felt differently depending on where you are. And ultimately is for you, the truth is that the hurt is flat. I'm not gonna argue with you because I don't think the earth are flat. And we might be thousands of years in the past and none of us has any reason or any tool to prove that the other one is wrong. But to me, the whole discussion is not worth because sometimes they are like sentimental truth that can be very true to yourself and yet not be true at all. So what matters to me 
is that in war something else happens. It's not that the first casualty is the truth. To me, the first casualty of war is innocence. And to me, innocence is everything. You know, somebody say that the creative adult is the child who survived. Beautifully put together. Because the child has the curiosity to poke the bear because he wants to question if the bear really is aggressive or if the bear could become a pet. Who wouldn't want to have a pet bear off the gloves? So this is about war. And to me, I was lucky to live in a period of absolute peace, where it's not that there were no wars in my lifetime, but war was not close to me. And now imagine, now that I live in Sydney, Australia, war couldn't be further away. But war is a reality. And so I am aware that everything that I've been enjoying as an individual is because we have been living in peace. So what's the price of peace? Well, I suppose that if you are in different regions of the world, that price is calculated with a different coinage. So I won't go there. But together with the disregard for the environment, on which we are all very much responsible, in a more passive way, when you go down to war, people are more actively involved. So you have the scientists, you have the generals, you have the politicians who want option, who want survival, who come up with idea that would be digested easily by a public. So you manufacture a consensus. So that is very much the beginning. But also you have the machinery, the weaponry. And to me, nothing is more oppressive than a submarine. Being inside a submarine in wartime must be the most frightening experience. And also a frightening experience because traditionally, and this is true, to these days, 95% of the personnel that is like within a submarine are not infantry, are not people that have been trained to wage war in the traditional way, if you want, with a sword and with a shield all the way down to like uh, a pistol uh, and uh, a machine gun. Yes, it's like all of these are professionals, are engineers, uh, are all these mariners who have to go through the most gruesome psychological drill in order to be able to withstand the survival within a submarine. And for survival, I mean just to be able to operate within a military structure, within a very small unit that is a submerged submarine. Mm, like awful, absolutely awful. But in World War II, you had many young German submariners who very much joined the U-boat fleet because they saw that would be the way to escape the body-to-body -body contact that you would have if you were part of the infantry. You would have to avoid going through villages, you would have to go through, you know, 
uh, your enemy territory and also when the war turns against you you will you would avoid to see the destruction of your own nation that is very much what happened to germany during world war ii and yet they come up with this idea that if the war could not be won victory could be disrupted so they start attacking through the U-boat, a uh, mercantile fleet. So not other military vessels, but very much like civilian vessels that were transporting people and tra transporting goods across the Atlantic. The most horrendous war that ended up with the American developing more and more sophisticated anti-submarines, mine, and uh, deep dive explosive that uh, would uh, render the whole operation a catastrophic failure. And then in 1944, they will start bombing Hamburg and all the ports around Hamburg and the Jutland uh, Peninsula in order to take down the naval base of the U-boat fleet of Germany. And so all these young mariners that have been trained, they have no more submarines to go to, and they have to join the infantry, defending their own country against the most horrendous war. So you have this that happens in every war where things never go as planned. And of course, you have the civilians, you have the elderly, you have the children, you have the mothers, you have the fathers, you have the animals, you have the trees, you have the rivers. Everything gets contaminated by war. So borders get rewritten so people can find themselves on the wrong side of the border. And so when the war ends, they're actually kicked out because the country who received the territory doesn't want them anymore. You have all of that. And to me, there is nothing more tragic. But how is that related to me? Well, in 1996, I have decided to leave Italy for good and to move to London. Once I was like 10 days before leaving, a good friend of mine by the name of Alessandro decided to join me. For very different reasons, we were both escaping our families. With the difference that I saw my departure of Italy as a definitive step. Whilst for Alessandro, it was just a short break once his family was going through some internal turmoil. In fact, Alessandro got back to Italy after six months and he never left, married with children, I've been told, whilst I never looked back. But funny enough, I remember distinctively when I decided to leave and my mom tried to convince me that because it was December, I would be better off doing Christmas at home and then leaving in January. I say like, no, 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 no. If I accept to do Christmas here, I will never leave. So I booked my ticket, 10th of December, 1996. And I left ahead of Alessandro that joined me after Christmas, looking for accommodation. And even those days, and I think very little has changed in that market, probably around any big city in the world, the most awful accommodation at the most extraordinary prices were on offer. And so I looked and looked and looked and looked and looked and looked and looked, and, looked, and eventually I find this incredibly beautiful Edwardian building in this beautiful, beautiful London street, no better than in 
South Kensington, one of the most distinguished suburbs of London, where wherever you went, you could see these wonderful blue plants highlighting which famous character have lived in that particular address. It was absolutely fabulous. Well, how fabulous you had the suburb, you had the street, you had the building, but not the accommodation. And so, when I decided to leave, I remember my mom hugging me on the door and my dad, he looked at me and he said, have a good time, see you in a couple of weeks. Oh, Papa, you didn't think I would make it. Not that I really made it, but you know, I'm still trying. In a sense, I'm still at war, but a war within myself. And so, off I went, and as it happens, after a while, you know, after a while, really, within the first week of January, my mom started bombarding me. Oh, you know, we have to come and visit you. We have to come and visit you. We have to come and visit you. And at the time, I had an uncle who was actually living in London. But I didn't want to spend time with him and, and, and live with him. I just wanted to be independent and I really wanted to be completely detached from my family. Who on one hand would have been the most wonderful family, but on the other hand, demanding like all parents are to a certain degree. So London to me, it was very much freedom. And in the sense that is where the outlook of our London experience for the first few months was very different between me and Alessandro who were sharing this tiny little room. Alessandro was waiting for news to come back. So for him, it was very much like purgatory. But for me, it was heaven in the making. Ah, I'm telling you. But when my uncle came to visit me, he could not believe the place I was living in, knowing too well where I was coming from, where I was living just a few weeks earlier. You know, I start with saying that the place was not in one of the floors of the building. No, 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 no. The place was underneath the building, in the basement, where traditionally in the 19th century, you would drop the coal and you would drop all the dirty stuff. The food would be taken upstairs where the servants would cook it. Even the servants would have the quarters in the very, very top of the building going up the stairs and in the middle and on the ground floor, up a few steps, that's where like the Patricia's family would live. But not for me. Me and Alessandro were sharing this incredibly small room. This room had two mattresses. The mattresses were supported by bricks. Not only that, but Alessandro was taller than me. He took the bigger bed. And the reason why I took the bigger bed is because mine was plugged between two walls and therefore the mattress was bent. It was like sleeping in a gondola. Mm. The place was underground. We only had a tiny, tiny little windows for which you would have rain, water, and cold air coming in. And it's the first things that Alessandro sealed within a few days of joining me. So that was the place. We had a bathroom that we would share with the other three rooms 
that have been miraculously being created in this underground basement that was truly horrendous. And I still remember when my mom insisting that they had to come and visit, they had to come and visit, they had to come and visit, eventually they did come and visit. And so I have told my parents that the place was like absolutely horrendous. But my parents saw that I was exaggerating and it was somehow a way for me to take credit for like a duress that wasn't really there. So imagine when they arrived, I booked a nice hotel in South Kensington and then they were eager to come and see my accommodation. And so we walk through these beautiful little streets uh, and there, there was one of these traditional small private park that you have in these squares that are only available for the resident of the people who live uh, in that particular square. So they are locked, but you get a key to go inside. So we didn't have the key who we were. If hundred years early, they were storing coals. Now they were storing shit. And the shit was us, the people who were trying to make it in London. And so we walked to these streets and my parents were ecstatic. And then we arrived in front of the house and they were truly happy. Then we say like, you know, for a moment, we were worried, but knowing you, we, not for a moment, we believed that your place could be something as terrible as you describe it. And as I was talking to them, trying to prepare them, I saw them taking the few steps up that they go towards the front door. And I say like, where are you going? And he said, like, what do you mean, where are we going? Are we not going in? Yes, I say, mom and dad, we are going in. But we are not going up, we are going down. These steep steps covering moss with the humidity. My dad had to hold the rail, and so did my mom, because it was very steep. We went inside this corridor. The corridor in order to create these free rooms have been made the narrowest as possible. And you have precarious electricity cables coming from the roof that would give electricity to the place. In our room, we had a wardrobe that had been created with two little doors in between these wall supporting pillars for the whole building. And inside you had a meter. In this meter, you would have to put 50 cents. And these 50 cents would give you electricity for something like a couple of hours. And we always had a jar full of these large 50 cents 50 pence, that was the only coin that this bloody device, you know, was accepting. And so, even at night, you could hear tuck, 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 there was a timer for the electricity. So it wasn't even a real meter that was calculating the consumption. It was time-based. <gasps> Incredible, and let me tell you, in few occasions when we were there, we wake up in the middle of the night. You will hear this, tuck, and there was a little bell, ping. You immediately have to get off the bed, no matter what the time, and immediately put another coin. Because within 20 minutes, with no coin, because of the humidity and the cold, the lack of isolation and the water coming down, the place will become like 
a wet fridge. It was really terrible. I remember one night we were so in sync that one night in the dark I bumped into Alessandro, who have also heard this tack and ding, all trying to put the 50 pence in. But I also remember one night, and it only happened once, when with our great horror, we realized that we have run out. The jar with the 50 cents was empty. In fact, I just realized we would keep these 50 pence in a glass for a pint of beer. And I still have that glass with me to these days. I brought it with me as a memory of when it was had to be full of these 50 cents. Anyway, that night at 2 a.m., we realized that we had no more coin and we have to survive until 6 a.m., 7 a.m. And at some point, I remember at 5 a.m., we were so cold that we all dressed up and we decided to go in one of the main train station in London. I can't remember if it was like Victoria Station was the closer to us. You know, we have to go inside there because that they had an area when they had some eat because we couldn't take it anymore. In the sense, we were still a little bit soft. But back to my parents, when they came down, they went through this dark corridor because nobody would pay for the light in the corridor. So you have to go through this corridor. My dad saw the cables. He said like, is it not this dangerous? He said like, look, Papa, don't worry about it. And then I took it into the room. My dad, in particular, was shocked. My mom thought it was funny, but what I saw that was absolutely hilarious is that we had only had one chair, one of these foldable chairs for our most illustrious guest. And we were sitting on the bed, me and my mom and my dad, Alessandro was out, my dad with Oro sat on the chair and the chair broke under his weight because he was a tall man. And he fell on the floor and I started laughing and laughing. And my dad says like, I'm glad at least one of us is laughing. Let's get out of here. And then we went to a nice restaurant. I spent six months there. And let me tell you, it was like, absolutely great time. In this wardrobe, I have all my nice jacket, and so I would just have to put a shirt, a tie, a jacket, a scarf, a hat, and come out from those steep little steps. And I was a respected gentleman living in South Kensington of London. Ah. That was like a story. And in fact, we had this landlord was this big and rather menacing black man from Jamaica who would make sure that every two weeks he would go, he would come and collect the money. And he always had, we always had the money ready for him. We were not trying to avoid him. And one day, after three or four months that, you were, that we were there, and I asked him, oh, his history, how was coming, what was doing. Of course, he wasn't the landlord, it was somebody paid. He was the strong man of the landlord, but he was extremely friendly. And one day I gave him a cigar. I said, you come from Jamaica from sure you appreciate a cigar. And he look at me and he says like, oh, you are the best tenant that this whole building had for the last 150 years. And that 
made my day. But my uncle was waiting in anticipation to know how my parents, and particularly my father, had taken the shock of going to this place. And so he said to me like, oh, let me tell you something. I call this place the submarine. You have been living in a submarine. And now that your parents have left London, and despite the shock, they were pleased to see your level of confidence, your level of determination, you know, I was, yes, I was running out of money. I have to ask some more money from them, but there was no going back for me. Whilst Alessandro was constantly calling his girlfriend, waiting to know when he could go back, was six and settle with his parents, uh, you know, for me, there was no way back. So my parents, were very pleased to see that I had the confidence and I had the strength to sort of go through that type of process, which in all honesty, it wasn't, I sort of make it funny, but it was tough. You have to be mentally tough. And, and even to this day, I had to be mentally tough. And so my uncle said, I always thought that you were living in a submarine. And now I can also say that you have survived one of these deep sea mine that the Americans put dump when they were starting escorting the mercantile fleet that will move the goods from uh, America to the UK. And that's when the U-boat could no longer interfere. And that's where the whole battle of the Atlantic in 1944 unraveled in a huge disaster because they were taking so many losses, the Germans U-boat, that the whole strategy had to be abandoned. Then they lost the ports, they lost the location when they kept the submarines because they were still bombing. That was the end. So my uncle, also a lover of history and an incredibly sensitive man, he said to me, I always thought that you lived in a submarine. Now you survived a deep sea mine, my parents. And so I thought that you deserve a little gift and gift from members of my family I never chocolate, I never wine, you know. It's like even with my parents, when money was coming because money is what I needed, there was always something else that had a special meaning. And my uncle was an expert of history. And he said, here is what I have for you, a spoon. I say, oh, uncle, but he's like, that's very nice. But he said to me like, mind you, this humble aluminum spoon is not your normal spoon. Because if you look at the back, as the swastika, and he has the M that signify that this one was a spoon of the Kree Marine of the German fleet for the submarines. So somebody took this spoon with him as a memento. Somebody, God knows what the story of what happened, but this is my story and my Nazi submarine spoon that I also keep as a memento, as a love of history. Because at the end of the war, when all men were spent, the people who were joining the fleet and they were joining the U-boats were starting to be the, the 15, 16, 17 years old. 
And even then they saw that they had better chance to survive in a U-boat than being uh, on the front, uh, you know, against the Russian or the advancing Americans uh, since the, the Normandy landing had already happened. And so this is also a tragic history because it's their innocence of these kids that were not old enough to join the war at the beginning. And I'm sure many of them must have been eager to join, eager to defend the motherland, and they might have been very much aligned with the, uh, the creed uh, and the personality cult uh, of Hitler himself. But many of them were not. And even the ones that were true believers, they quickly become disillusioned when they saw that their own country was falling apart and that all the victories that had been promised and that they did appear magically at the beginning of the war and now left the entire city crumbling in destruction. So I'm saying this because these are days when there are still people shouting Heil Hitler or Viva il Duce, you know, for Mussolini. And so this is a warning. Whenever you come across a politician that talks to you under the best premises and with the best arguments about the right of the nation, I want to remind you that your loyalty should always first be towards your fellow human beings, regardless the nationality, regardless the religion, regardless of the race. And this is one of the things that not only I learned traveling and living overseas, but it's something that I love and that I embrace wherever I lived, even if I'm a white European educated, maybe with a little bit of money, where well, certainly I can't ask my parents for any more money, the money is gone. So this is what I'm saying to you today, that after all is Easter, a period that is signified by peace and peace is nowhere to be found around the world. But remember, we are not only what we eat, but we are the culture that we embrace. And so, off goes my spoon, and here comes my Easter hug. Thank you and see you next week.